I didn't realize I ran a red light. And I got out of the car, walked back to their car. My feelings were that what I had done was going to cause me to go to death row. So when the officer turned away from me, I shot those officers. On July 22nd, 1957, in the city of El Segundo, four teenagers were stripped naked on the lover's lane. They roamed around, asking for help, in shock at what had just happened to them. At some distance, 28-year-old Officer Phillips and 27-year-old Officer Curtis were doing their regular patrolling near the traffic signal when they met a case of rash driving. Two other officers passed by asking if everything was all right and the patrolling officers waved at them, signaling that everything was fine. But the next thing you know, gunshots had been fired, leaving the two police officers dead. Was there a relation between these crimes? And what motive did these bizarre crimes hold? Let's find out. Hello, and welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. But before we delve any further, please take the time to show your support by subscribing to our channel, liking our videos, and clicking on that notification bell to receive the latest videos straight to your inbox. El Segundo is located in Los Angeles County, California. El Segundo has a small town feel with a charming downtown area and numerous parks and green spaces. The city is just a few miles from the beaches of Manhattan and Hermosa, making it a popular spot for residents and visitors. But despite these achievements, Los Angeles County has been ranked as the most perilous place in the entire United States for police officers, with a harrowing statistic of nearly one officer being shot while on duty every single day of the year. A specialized Crimes Against Police Officers unit had been established to prosecute those who harm or kill law enforcement officials with the unit frequently handling cases where five, six, seven, eight, or even ten police officers are shot at in any given week. It was in this county's small city, El Segundo, that a ruthless cop killing in 1957 haunted the police force for nearly half a century. On the summer night of July 22, 1957, a group of four teenagers, including the 17-year-old Bob Dewar, were driving down a well-known lover's lane in Hawthorne, California after a party. The two boys, including Dewar, were looking for a safe place to hang around with their two female friends. Dewar decided to roll down a window and enjoy the warm air, when suddenly, a man appeared and pointed a gun at his face. Now you saw the gun as the only thing that came through the window. That was my whole life in that millisecond. The man demanded money and assured the teens that he wouldn't harm them. The frightened teens handed over their money and prayed that the man would keep his word. After this, they were forced at gunpoint by the man to undress. The man then used surgical tape and a flashlight to tie up their hands and cover their eyes. One of the young women was also assaulted while the others lay helpless. The man threatened to kill them and ordered them to march into a nearby field. Well, I thought for sure that he would kill the girl because she probably had seen him, but I guess he was gonna kill all of us. And we st stood out there stark naked for like three or four minutes, and we just expected to hear the gun start going off. As they stumbled blindly, they heard their car's door close and the sound of the car driving away. The man had stolen their vehicle, leaving them stranded in the middle of nowhere, naked and vulnerable. At some distance, two police officers, 28-year-old Richard Phillips, and 27-year-old Milton Curtis were on patrol when they saw a car run a red light. They pulled the car over and asked the driver to get out. While they were doing this, another police car drove by and offered to help, but Richard and Milton signaled that everything was all right. The car had not been reported stolen at that time, therefore it was not in the system. So there was no way for those officers to have known that was a stolen vehicle or it had just been um, used in that crime. Suddenly, the driver pulled out a 22 caliber revolver and shot both officers three times each. Officer Phillips managed to shoot back three times before calling for backup on the radio, despite being badly hurt. Alas, both the officers died at the crime scene. He's like, what are they doing here? And uh, 
it was pretty much like, uh, he's sleeping, but why doesn't he come home and sleep? And uh, she says he's in heaven. As the news of the brutal killing of officers Phillips and Curtis spread like wildfire through the community, the police were on high alert. Every lead was followed and every bystander was questioned, but the case seemed to be at a standstill. That was until the four terrified teenagers who had been brutally robbed and assaulted stumbled onto the scene, revealing a crucial piece of information that linked their case to the murders of the officers, the car. Within minutes, the police had located the abandoned 1949 Ford sedan. The car had bullet holes that were made by Officer Phillips taking shots at the attacker. The police also took fingerprints from the teenager's clothes in the car, but it yielded nothing. When they called me that, that there had been two policemen shot and killed, so I, I knew the uh, importance of the situation. Uh, if there was any evidence that I could get, I'd have to get it. With no other leads to follow, the police were at a loss. The media was on the case, spreading the word far and wide. As the days turned into weeks, the tension mounted, but the case was just not progressing. In 1958, True Detective magazine featured the murders along with a plea for the public's help. All leads that came in from it were checked, but nothing turned up. The investigation into the murders of the two officers and the robbery of the teenagers had hit a dead end. But then, two years later in 1960, a resident in Manhattan Beach made a shocking discovery. Two watches and a revolver were found buried in his backyard, and the watches were found to belong to the four teenagers whose car and belongings were taken forcefully by the criminal. He was clearing out his backyard and found the chamber to a handgun and thought, well, maybe it had something to do with the frame that he found a year prior. So he went in his garage, looked at it, put it together, and found that uh, it was a match. The police ran ballistics tests on the gun and discovered that it was the same one used to kill the officers. But despite tracking the revolver's serial number, they were unable to identify the owner or the killer. The trail seemed to have gone cold once again. It wasn't until later that investigators discovered that the gun was purchased just four days before the murders in a Sears store in Shreveport, Louisiana. The buyer had used the name G.D. Wilson and given a fake address in Miami, Florida. The person who sold that gun, he told them that he believed the man was from out of town and uh, his accent didn't sound like a Louisiana accent, it sounded more Southern uh, than that. A customer at the YMCA near the Sears store had signed in under the name George D. Wilson, claiming to be from Miami and using the same fake address. We actually went into the room where this George Wilson had checked in and from this window of this uh, room, you could see the Sears store. Um, and it was just kind of, for us, it was kind of overwhelming being in there and seeing that and trying to figure out what was going on in this man's mind when he was there. The police now had a lead, but it led them to dead end after dead end. They tracked down every George D. Wilson in the Miami area, but none of them was the killer. The case remained unsolved, and the killer remained at large, haunting the memories of those who remembered that fateful night. But due to a lack of new leads and information, the case went cold again. But then over a period of time too, it, it was like nothing was being solved, nothing was coming up, everything went cold on it. Decades later, in 2002, a glimmer of hope emerged when El Segundo officers received a chilling tip from a woman claiming that her uncle had bragged about killing two police officers. As investigators delved deeper, they discovered that her uncle's fingerprints had been previously checked against those found in the getaway car in the late 1950s, but to no avail. Nevertheless, this tip brought renewed attention to the case, and it was decided that the original prints would be re-examined using the FBI's Integrated Automated Fingerprint Identification System, or IAFIS. Sometimes there's areas that are not clear they could be smudged, there could be artifacts in there that are not clear. So the computer may count that or, or read that as a particular characteristic. The prints were entered into the system, and after some time, 
the system revealed that the prints were a match to a man named Gerald Fitton Mason. We stood hovering over his computer screen, looking at all the ridge structure and the information there, and everything coincided. My words were, oh my God. The police were puzzled because the man of this name was never suspected during the investigation. Gerald Fitton Mason, a man with a troubled past, was born in South Carolina on January 31st, 1934. After a brief stint in the army, he quickly found himself on the wrong side of the law, getting arrested for homebreaking and larceny in the 1950s. He only served eight months of his three-year sentence and was then released. It was shortly after this that he was involved in the incidents in El Segundo. Eventually, after that, Mason settled down and married his wife, Betty, in 1960, starting a family with two daughters who would later give him three grandchildren. He led a seemingly normal life as a successful gas station and convenience store owner in the Columbia area. The investigators had been working tirelessly to solve the case, and finally, they had their lead. Signatures from the YMCA registry and Sears store receipts were matched with current handwriting samples for Mason but they needed more evidence to build a solid case. Now we've got a real suspect, but we were still a little bit apprehensive. Um, okay, it's a fingerprint, it's an old fingerprint. What else do we have? That's when they found three eyewitnesses who could still identify Mason. The two officers who were waved off on the night of the murder and a news reporter from the murder scene. The reporter recalled that Mason had asked him for a ride home somewhere near the crime scene. On January 29th, 2003, the investigators arrived at Mason's door. When he opened it, they told him they were from El Segundo and were homicide detectives. As the investigators confronted Mason, he stammered and said that he thought he needed a lawyer, hoping to buy himself some time. However, the detectives were relentless and informed him that they were there to arrest him for the murder of two police officers over 45 years ago. Mason gasped in disbelief. He said he couldn't believe they were bothering him with something that happened so many years ago, trying to deflect their accusations. When we introduced ourselves and told him we were homicide investigators, he was a little bit irritated and it was almost like, you're here for that? That happened so long ago. I can't believe you're here bothering me with that, you know, 45, 46 years later. But the detectives were unrelenting and they took him into custody for questioning. As they examined his body for evidence, they found a scar on the back of his right shoulder blade, a stark reminder of the third bullet that came out from the late Officer Phillips's gun. The very last thing he did in life was to mark forever the man who killed him and his partner. And um, that's pretty compelling because it's almost as if uh, someone is speaking to you from the grave telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I told you who it is. I pointed him out with my gunfire. Under questioning, Mason gave a puzzling explanation for the crimes, claiming that he'd bought the revolver solely to fend off potential hitchhiking robbers. Now, why would someone who bought a revolver to protect himself commit such heinous crimes? Maybe the weapon affected Mason's psychology, making him more and more barbaric. But then, the investigators soon discovered a strange collection of guns in his home including another one of the same rare nine-shot 22 revolvers used in the murders. So, it was clear that the reason Mason gave for purchasing the guns was totally a desperate lie. Amidst these bizarre circumstances, Mason was charged with two counts of murder, as well as additional charges for kidnapping, robbery, and assault. As the trial approached, Mason's family watched in despair as he accepted a plea deal that would drop the charges of kidnapping, robbery, and assault. On March 24, 2003, the day of the plea deal, Mason looked tired and defeated. He knew that he'd be spending the rest of his life in prison, but he wanted to spare his family the anguish of a full trial. I didn't realize I ran a red light, and I got out of the car, walked back to their car. My feelings were that what I had done was going to cause me to go to death row. So when the officer turned away from me, I shot those officers. As he pled guilty to two counts of murder, the families of the slain officers wept openly, 
and even Mason's own family looked on in silence, devastated by what had become of their loved one. Mason was sentenced to two life terms in prison, and as he stood before the court, he made a plea for forgiveness. It is impossible to express to so many people how sorry I am for the harm I inflicted that night. I do not understand why I did this. It is contrary to all I believe in. It does not fit in my life. It is not the person I know. I detest these crimes. He continued, with tears streaming down his face, that he didn't know why he did it and pleaded for forgiveness, begging them not to be bitter. He apologized profusely, saying he was so sorry for what he'd done. Despite his emotional plea, the family of Officer Curtis was unmoved. They believed that Mason was only remorseful because he'd been caught. Carolyn, Officer Phillips' daughter, expressed that Mason had caused her mother to become a widow and that his cowardly act had shattered their family's lives permanently. She stated that they could not and would not forgive him. Jean Curtis, Officer Milton Curtis's wife, shared that her husband was her first love. She revealed that on the night of the murder, they had a minor disagreement and she'd always felt guilty about it. She added that they never had the chance to say goodbye. Her words weighed heavily in the courtroom as silence fell. After years of waiting for justice, Officer Curtis and Officer Phillips' families finally received closure. The murderer was found, tried, and sentenced to life in prison. However, the pain of their loss never fully healed, and they were left to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. Jean Curtis was left with only memories of her beloved husband, while Officer Phillips's children were forced to grow up without a father. What people would say about him being at 24 years old and committing these crimes and living a life crime-free, it doesn't matter. He's a thief, he's a rapist, and he's a murderer. He just got old. That's all there is to it. No one could have predicted the young girl's disappearance would begin one of Italy's most expensive manhunts and captivate a nation so deeply. It would become one of Italy's most complex investigations to date. But where was Yara? 